Well, John MacArthur from Panorama City, California, was talking about the most bantied about phrase that's used around Christmas time. And I, I thought it was an interesting thought. What's the most used phrase that people use at Christmas time, both in the secular world and in the Christian world? And he said it's the word or the phrase, the spirit of Christmas. Even people who don't give Jesus Christ the time of day will use the phrase, the spirit of Christmas. And it means different things to different people. For instance, to the retail industry, it's a big deal. The spirit of Christmas to some people is spending money and shopping. Let me give you this statistic. This is the latest statistic I could find that in holiday retail sales in the United States will be $630 billion this year. $630 billion. That's more than you make in a year. I mean, it's an incredible amount of money. We spend Christmas trees alone, we spend $1.2 billion a year. $1.2 billion just on trees. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just what people, people do. And that's for some people, the spirit of Christmas is spending, buying, participating in, in the commerce of, of, of Christmas. To other people, it's the card industry. Sending cards. Many people send cards, and we appreciate the cards we get from people like you, and we look forward to seeing pictures of people, and, it, and it's a blessing. But that's not the spirit of Christmas. To other people, it's alcohol. But you know, there's one liquor distributor in L.A. that uh, MacArthur was talking about. They said during the Christmas season a few years ago, just on one day, one day, that particular wholesaler took in one million bucks in one day of sales. For them, the Christmas spirit is drinking and alcohol consumption, just making a, a neutral comment about that. For other people, it's a sad day. I, one of the saddest poems I've ever read is by Earl Weiler. I don't even know who he is. Christmas is a bitter day for mothers who are poor. Listen to that again. Christmas is a bitter day for mothers who are poor. The wistful eyes of children are daggers to endure. Though the shops and stores and malls are crammed with playthings, they're not for everyone. And if a mother's wallet is empty, there might, be, there might as well be none. If a mother's wallet is empty, there might as well be none. And then he said the opposite of that is the person who's got a wallet full of money. They've got all kinds of cash and credit cards. My wallet is full of money, but I cannot buy a toy. Only a wreath of holly for the grave of my child. Only a wreath of holly for the grave of my child. And you know, Christmas intensifies a lot of things, both good and bad. Christmas will intensify grief. Christmas intensifies marital problems, disagreements. I, everywhere I've been, every city I've, I've ministered in, there are people that have told me that they have a family member at Christmas who every year blows up at some point during the holidays and lets people have it. It's because they're in pain, they're hurting. And the Christmas season just intensifies the emotions that they're feeling. And things come to the surface and it's like a boil that's lanced. And all kinds of stuff comes out emotionally and, and out of a person's life. But today, I want to give you one word that describes the Christmas spirit. You can go home with a one-word definition of the Christmas spirit. It begins with the letter W. It's the word worship. Why would you pick the word worship for Christmas spirit for this reason? We're going to read about two women in the Gospel of Luke, a woman by the name of Elizabeth, who would be the mother of John the Baptist, wife of Zechariah the priest, and a relative, perhaps a cousin of Mary, and Mary, who would be the mother of the the physical body of Jesus on earth and the incarnation, God becoming flesh. And those two women define the Christmas spirit for me. It all has to do with worship. Read it with me and see if you don't agree. It's in Luke 1, exactly where Kevin left off last week, verse 39, that says this, at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town. She just found out that she's going to have the baby Jesus from an angel Gabriel last week. Hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard, I want you to underline the word heard in your heart, because I'm going to talk about the word heard, H-E-A-R-D in a minute. Heard Mary's greeting, the, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, Mary, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord? She recognized before Jesus was even born, the baby that Mary was carrying was the Messiah. The mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord, what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Now I'm going to continue with the next verses that are called the Magnificat. It's Latin for magnifying the Lord. It's a psalm that came forth out of Mary's spirit and heart. We'll talk about it. It's one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible. Uh, Mary responding to being told she's going to give birth to the Messiah. But I want to talk about what Elizabeth said. Twice it's mentioned. Elizabeth said, when I heard... When I heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. I, I'm interested in that word, heard. Let me tell you why. There are things that happen in your life and in my life, get this, just because you hear it. Don't raise your hands, but some of you know what it's like to be at a hospital. And you get bad news. And just hearing the bad news, it has physiological effects on your body. You physically slump down and say, no. And conversely, some of you have been in a hospital situation where you hear good news and you stand up and say, praise God. Works both ways. There's a physiological response to things we hear. I didn't really understand that till I read some writing by a French ear, nose, and throat specialist by the name of Dr. Alfred Tomatis, who spent 50 years trying to understand hearing and its function. He believed that the ear was the most important of all our sense organs. He said the ear controls a sense of balance, rhythm, and movement, and is the conductor of the entire nervous system. Some of this I don't even understand, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Through the medulla, the auditory nerve connects with all the muscles of the body. Hence, muscle tone, equilibrium, flexibility, and vision are affected by sound. Through the vagus nerve, the inner ear connects with the larynx, lungs, stomach, liver, bladder, kidneys, small intestine, and large intestine. Tomatis believed that high-frequency sounds, 300 hertz and above, would literally physically activate the brain and affect cognitive functions such as thinking, spatial perception, and memory. Listening to sounds increases our attentiveness and concentration. You say, why, why are you telling us all this technical stuff about hearing? Does it give you a new appreciation for Romans 10, 17 that says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's power just in what you and I hear. And I find it intriguing that the Lord made the choice. I didn't. The Lord made the choice that when people would hear the gospel, hear it proclaimed that something physiological, something spiritual, something emotional would happen inside them all because of what they heard. All because of what they heard. Now this is funny and I, I'm not even sure the significance of this, but part of the article I was reading about hearing said that they've done experiments where they take headphones and instead of putting it on the heads of these people, these test patients, they put it on their ankles. And they had physiological response. I don't know how they measured it, but they measured physiological response because of the sound waves going to your ankles. Try it this afternoon. Who knows? Maybe you'll have a pleasant experience. It'll be a new experience to listen to your headphones through your ankles. And all twice, Elizabeth said, when I heard the baby inside me leaped for joy. When I heard the words, there was a physiological response. When you hear the gospel of Christ, something happens. When you hear that you are a sinner and you need forgiveness just like me, something happened to me when I heard that. And something happens to every man and every woman at some point in time. Even if it hasn't happened, you know what you need to pray for? God, let it happen in me. Let it happen in my life that what I hear from the word of God from Scripture impacts me. Now, let's read about Mary's psalm of praise that she offers up to the Lord. It's in the very next verse. 
verse 46, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. That's a figurative expression for God's power. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. I'm going to talk about that, a verse I never understood all my life until this week. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. God remembers to be merciful to you. And to me, he doesn't forget, just like you forget to be merciful to your husband. You forget to be merciful to your wife or your children or your parents or to your neighbors or brother or sister. God doesn't forget to be merciful to you. I need to know that. To Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. I want to talk about 46 and 47 in particular. 46 says, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Soul and spirit, in my opinion, are two different things. I believe we're triune beings, which is a big phrase that means we're body, soul, and spirit. Your body is your body. Most people can figure that out, deduce that. Your soul is your personality. Your soul is your intellect. It's the part of you that thinks, the part of you that decides. And so when Mary, first of all, says, my soul glorifies the Lord, that's what we do in worship, with our minds and our personality. In our intellect, we praise God. We worship the Lord. Christmas is about worship. That's the the operative word today. The spirit of Christmas is worship. But then she says in verse 47, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, your spirit's the part of you that reaches out to the Lord. May I tell you what your spirit is? It's where you feel the greatest need for forgiveness in your spirit. It's where you feel conviction for what you've done to other people. I have hurt other people. That doesn't happen in your mind. It happens in your spirit. God convicts your soul about something you've said, something you've done, something you've neglected to do. I want to suggest to you that's going on in your spirit, not just in your intellect or mind, but in your spirit. And isn't it interesting? Mary says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then Mary recognizes the humility of her condition in verse 48. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Who's his servant? Mary. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arms, and he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. God gives his grace to the humble, the Bible says, his gifts. But he opposes as an opponent the proud man. Did you know the Bible says that? He opposes as an opponent the proud man, the proud woman, but he gives his gifts to the humble. And it's interesting that Mary tells us that he scatters those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. That's where pride takes place. Listen carefully. Some of you have never heard this before. You can be a proud man, but nobody knows it but you. You can be a proud woman, and nobody knows about it. You disguise it so well. Nobody knows about it but you, and the same is true with me. Pride is in our inmost thoughts, and when it's Jesus, or Mary says, he scatters. I found out that was a, an agricultural term about winnowing. God takes the proud man and takes his thoughts and he throws them up in the air like a handful of grain. He scatters their thinking and reverses things in their life. And so the proud man comes to a place in his life where God shakes his life up and he says, I'm not such a hot shot after all. I need forgiveness. 
I'm not the hot commodity I thought I was. I need God's help in my life. I need forgiveness. I need his sustaining grace. I need his power in my life. Our marriage needs this from the Lord. We need the blessing of God, and I've always thought it was up to us. And God scatters the thoughts of the proud and their inmost thoughts. And then verse 82 or 52, he has brought down rulers from their thrones and he has lifted up the humble. Anybody remember the Shah of Iran years ago? Was that the 70s or 80s? Well, I think it was in the 80s. Did you know that he actually had the audacity to refer to himself at one time as the king of kings? The king of kings. You see how arrogant that is? That's a title somebody told me for Jesus. The Lord of lords and the king of kings and the Shah of Iran referred to himself as the king of kings. What does it say in that verse I just read? God has brought down rulers from their thrones but he lifts up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things. He has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. I referenced it earlier, but God remembers to be merciful even when you and I don't. I want to talk about that for a second. Some of you don't never think to be merciful to people in your own family. Isn't that amazing how people can be the least Merciful to the people there, they say we love them and we're the closest to them, and we show the least amount of mercy. I'm thankful that God remembers to be merciful to people like you and people like me. Victor Frankl was a psychiatrist from Vienna, was the father of a therapy known as logotherapy. I don't even know what that is. Logo means word. It obviously has something to do with the word word. But he said this to people in his seminar, project yourself, project yourself onto your deathbed, which is a negative thought on the face of it. Project yourself onto your deathbed. And then while you're on your deathbed, think back. What from that point of view would you, do you wish you had done with your life? Now that may be a morbid thought to somebody today, but it's a realistic thought. If you were to project yourself onto your deathbed and You've been around a deathbed perhaps in your life. I've been around so many I've lost count. I, I literally have lost count of how many people I've been with at the point of death. And, and you put yourself in that situation and you would look back on your life. What would you change about your life? Does that give anybody pause? Does that make any husband here feel different about the way he relates to his wife? Yeah. Does that impact a woman in any way and how she relates to her husband or children, to our family? It would. Project yourself on your deathbed and look back and say, what would have I done differently? What would have I said differently? What choices would have I made? What decisions would have I made differently? I love the story told by Bruce Larson from California about a woman in the church he served in California, probably back in the 70s or 80s. Her name was Ruth, older lady. She was in her 80s. She had grown up in a small town in North Dakota. She went to a one-room schoolhouse. And one winter's day, a typical North Dakota blizzard hit, 40 degrees below zero. One by one, parents arrived to the one-room schoolhouse to escort their children home safely in this blinding storm. Ruth told Bruce Larson that soon what happened, she and the teacher were the only two that remained. All the other parents came to get their children. It looked as if they would be stranded all night at the school. The teacher, obviously worried, tried to reassure her young charge, uh, Ruth, I have one bucket of coal for the stove and one sandwich. I hope it'll get, it will get us through the night. Ruth answered firmly, oh, teacher, don't worry. My dad, my father will come and get us. Since so many hours had elapsed, the teacher was at the very least skeptical. Oh, Ruth, how do you know your dad will come for us? And as a seven-year-old child, it's the innocence of a child speaking here. Don't, don't look critically on what she said. Here's what this seven-year-old girl said. My, my father up in heaven will speak to my father here on earth, and he'll come for us. And the teacher condescendingly said, yeah, that's, that's beautiful, sweetheart. That's really nice, especially when we're freezing tonight. I'll be thinking about that kind of thing. But sure enough, after dark, the father showed up, tied ropes to both of them behind them, 
and they fought the way through the blizzard back to the safety of home. Ruth said, told Bruce Larson, she said, I had an unforgettable lesson about my earthly father and my heavenly father. Wow, what a statement. I had an unbelievable, unforgettable lesson about my earthly father and my heavenly father. What's that have to do with this passage in Luke? Everything. Everything about coming to the Lord, coming to terms with your past, coming to terms with your present and your future is coming home to the Father through the Son. That's the message of Christmas. You come to the Father through the Son. God became flesh, John 1 says, and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. That's a big term that simply means God became human. And through the virgin birth, through Mary, was born into this earth in abject humility and poverty in a barn. And I never understood this until recently. The, the shepherds were told, this will be the sign to you, not that you'll find a baby in Bethlehem. There are plenty of babies born in Bethlehem. And not that you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes or cloths. You know what the sign was? He'll be in a trough. We've glorified the, the manger scene. And the, all that, but it was a trough. It was a feeding trough. That's the sign that the Son of God is here, which I find intriguing. You'll find him in a feeding trough. God humbled himself, the Bible says, even to the point of a cross. Not just his birth, but his death, burial, and then he's coming again. That's the good news of Christmas. One word I want you to go home with today, it's not about money, it's not about spending, it's not about trees or cards, it's not about... Alcohol, the Christmas spirit, is about one word that begins with the letter W, worship. Worship. Did you know in the Gospel of Matthew, I, I was just reading this this morning, the wise men are coming to see Jesus. They've got gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, stuff that's worth a lot of money back in its day. And you know what it says in Matthew? They got on their knees and worshiped him. That's Christmas. It's all about worship, always has been, always will be. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us this Christmas about the spirit of Christmas. It's in one word, the word worship. We learn that from Elizabeth, and we learn that from Mary, most of all today. She worshiped her Father in heaven when she found out she was carrying the Savior of the world. What a blessing to her life, and to put it mildly but she expressed her thanksgiving and her gratitude. And for her, it was an atti attitude of worship. May it be said of us that our spirit of Christmas for us is wrapped up in a word called worship. Maybe we'll be able to tell somebody this week who's talking about the spirit of Christmas, and we can say, I heard a message about it. The spirit of, worship, the spirit of Christmas is the word worship. Might be an insight for somebody for the first time in their life. That's what it's all about. Lord, bless this decision time in this middle service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.